All right, so we finally got to the last section of this presentation where we can discuss the postmodern approach approach to knowledge. Um, so the the postmodern approach is highly complex, and even though the previous approaches were all very complex, I think this one's probably the most difficult of all to to wrap one's mind around, and it's the kind of thing that probably takes uh, several weeks or months of lectures to really. Um, dig deep into it um, and it's way more than I can address in <clears throat> in like a 30 minute presentation however there's something about this approach that makes it uh, somewhat easy to to relate because it, it developed uh, as a, a series of metaphors and when we fixate on the metaphors we can kind of wrap our minds around um, how people worked their way through this, this things up to where we are today. Okay, so what I'm uh, what I'm gonna be covering, um, somebody could probably just uh, get uh, through this book by Nancy Murphy. It's called the Philosophy of the Christian Religion. Uh, in fact, probably everything in in the the modern, the pre modern, the modern, and the post modern sections you could probably get in a lot more detail and a lot more carefully presented in her book. She doesn't deal with what I've what I've covered in the atheist section, and then there's there's something at the end which I think is extremely important, and uh, I'm not sure why she never um, actually got to that final conclusion. Um, but other than those two elements, everything else you could somebody could get in a lot more detail than I could give in this quick videos uh, about any of these perspectives. Okay. So we begin here with Karl Popper, who would still fit under the under the <clears throat> modernist view. Um, so uh, already by 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 the time uh, Popper is already in the 20, 20th century, so he's further down, obviously from Descartes, quite a, quite a ways down. But um, they're they're they've more or less moved away from the foundationless metaphor. So I just I'm just gonna go ahead and read this paragraph. He says. <clears throat> The empirical basis of objective science has does nothing absolute about it. Science does not rest upon solid bedrock. The bold structure of his theories rises as it were above a swamp. It is like a building erected on piles. The piles are driven down from above into the swamp, but not down to any natural or given base. And if we stop driving the piles deeper, it is not because we have reached firm ground. We simply stop when we are satisfied that the piles are firm enough to carry the structure at least for the time being okay so uh, <clears throat> there's a clear shift here away from the foundation metaphor that people started with in the time of Descartes and obviously people are, recognize the fact that there's that layer uh, that is unprovable kind of in between um, I think therefore I am and being able to develop scientific knowledge you know, we don't, we cannot prove that the world exists, that other minds exist, any of that stuff. But essentially by Popper's time, they're saying like, we don't need to prove all that. Science just needs uh, something stable enough for the rest of the structure to build on. It doesn't have to go all the way down to some sort of solid individual, individual foundation, right? Okay, so um, Karl Popper's one of the most significant philosophers of science before the postmodern era. And uh, one of his key contributions, the idea of falsification uh, in terms of how do we know how the science, how the scientific knowledge progress, where it progresses not so much by proving stuff, but by proving that stuff doesn't work and kind of eliminating false knowledge. Uh, we falsify claims and then we can move on. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, after after Popper, however, the the metaphor ha has moved. Um, people move away from the whole concept of the foundation altogether. So uh, W. V. O. Quine, by the time he comes around, he just gets rid of the foundation metaphor and comes up with the idea of a web of beliefs. So here the the beliefs are not stable because they're resting on anything. They're stable by their interconnectedness. So uh, this particular component is true because it fits well with all the other components which we believe to be true. 
And if at any point in time following Popper's calcification process, uh, we decide that some <clears throat> some component we can no longer take seriously, like we've we've reached a stage where we realize like, oh no, this cannot be true, it doesn't work anymore. We can replace it. And the reason we can replace it is because we have all this surrounding components that are still stable and it provides something stable for us to work to replace that one element with. So Popper feels that, I mean, not Popper, Quine, he feels that the way knowledge progresses in science is by this web of beliefs that moves forward or, or improves by individual components being replaced while surrounding components stay in place and provide a structure that helps us to replace it properly, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> already addressed that uh so the updates or any any uh any correction to this level of beliefs makes it is possible like i said because the other components are still there all right so after coin we have thomas kuhn and kuhn adopts the metaphor that coin provided but says hey what coin is saying is correct for the most part so he takes up the metaphor um, yeah, for the most part, science is like that. Science is the way Quine uh, <clears throat> explained it, where we slowly discover more stuff and we update our web of beliefs and the surrounding components are there to help us to provide a structure for us to make those updates. However, if we look at science historically, it's not always like that. It's like that for the most part, but then there's this rare occasional situations where we don't just have to update one belief, but we have to update a whole section of beliefs, maybe close to the entire web sometimes, because we realize that something just doesn't work anymore. And uh, Kuhn, to, to, to describe that particular process, Kuhn called this a paradigm shift. So essentially, he said that if we're honest with ourselves as we look back and, at the history of science, um, science goes through this sort of boring stages, kind of like where we just have little updates here and there, and we keep making progress. But then something happens, and there's an entire paradigm shift where essentially we have to replace almost the entire web at once. And he was more concerned about those paradigm shifts because he felt that like that was a more, more realistic description of the way science operates. Um, and because of this, he felt that all the data at any given time is dependent on the particular paradigm that we're working with at that moment in time. So there's no independent facts. Facts um, make sense within a paradigm. And when we have a paradigm shift, we have to reinterpret or discard or replace those facts based on the new paradigm. <clears throat> Uh, and then one of the one of the uh, claims that Kuhn made is that when we switch from one paradigm to the next, the two paradigms are incommensurable, which means that um, they're so different that it's difficult even to communicate across because even the, the language and the terminology doesn't really mean the same thing from one paradigm to another. Um, so um, like, for example, the word matter probably means something very different to a modern scientist than it meant to somebody that left a few hundred years ago because there was a very different framework of understanding of reality around that word, right? Okay, so then after Thomas Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn um, created a, a massive uh, obster within, within uh, the realm of um, the philosophy of science um, and, and there was a lot of controversy and a lot of opposition, but uh, he, he was also extremely influential. And after him, uh, what, one, of the, one of the issues with Kuhn's, uh, Kuhn's uh, proposal was that it seemed to create a kind of a, a relativistic uh, sense to, to science and to say, well, how do we trust anything? Because what if we have another paradigm shift? How do we know anything about what? Uh, the things we think we know about reality. Uh, so then Lakatos comes around and says, well, um, paradigms don't have to be so incommensurable that they cannot coexist. Like it, it seemed that the way that Kuhn was presenting it was that 
the, the way that we shift from one paradigm to another is that the previous generations of scientists die off and people will adopt the new, the new paradigm and move on from there kind of thing. But he said, look, paradigms don't have to, to be so distant from each other that they cannot coexist. In fact, you could have multiple paradigms um, functioning at once. Um, and then we can compare those paradigms based on how well they, they explain the data that they're working with. So the, the analogy or the metaphor that, that Lakatos introduced was the, the metaphor of competing research programs. So you could have multiple research programs running at the same time. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, if let's say there's, mo there's, a, there's, uh, there's two different research programs here competing for, uh, uh, acting as competing explanation for some, some body of data, um, over time, it will appear that one research program is progressive while the other one is degenerating. However, the person or the, the individuals that are working on the degenerating program might choose to stick with it because it's possible that over time they might discover something that will actually make this one more progressive. And uh, as long as they're willing to agree that at that moment in time, their program is more de is degenerating and they don't try to come up with uh, um, kind of, uh, um, what's the word, uh, ad hoc explanations um, for for why is, for why things are not working out and try to justify it, but recognize like no at this point in time this is degenerating this one seems to be more progressive progressive but we're gonna stick with this one because we think maybe over time it might still have a chance then then that's fine and people can work um, at the same time as you know as long as they're honest about where the the research program is at um, so <clears throat> the the problem with 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 Lakatos's thing, however, was that um yeah, this is a mistake, you should say Lakatos. The the problem with this is that how do we know if if different research programs can shift over time? So one seems progressive today, but maybe tomorrow the other one is more progressive. How do we know which one to go with? So there was a bit of confusion here. And then the other question is, how long do we wait before we discard a program? So if we find a program that seems to be degenerating <clears throat> and somebody decides somebody decides to go ahead and stick with it and they continue to work within that research program for another set of years or decades, how long do they go before they it reaches a place where <clears throat> it's safe to say it's not going to work, let's move on? And th these were not... Um, answers that Lakatos was able to provide. However, uh, McIntyre comes on the scene and he gives this additional um, additional contribution here where he says, the theory that can explain its rival successes and acknowledge failures in a way that the rival cannot is, is uh, not only more progressive, but it's, it's progressive in a sense that we can actually uh, count on that and and uh, in other words, it, it it gives it an additional level of credibility that Lakatos was not providing earlier to to make it seem like there's a way to differentiate between competing points of view. So in other words, you could have a research program and you recognize that there's problems with your program, but you don't you don't know why. Like you cannot explain why things are not working out the way you expect them to. But this other research program looks at your, your problems as the same. Within my paradigm, I actually have an explanation as to that, that explains why you're failing here and here and why you were successful in this other areas. So if that's the case, if this other research program is able to address the issues of the, of the competition the way that the competition cannot do in reverse, then that means this one is definitely superior and uh, we can give it our attention at this moment in time. All right, so this is how far Nancy Murphy has taken this. And uh, according to according to her book, the one I, the philosophy of Christian theology that I mentioned earlier, uh, Nancy looks at this and says, okay, this this all these are developments in the philosophy of science, but they apply just as well to theology. And not just this, but it is only now, when we take all these components together, 
uh, at this moment in time, after all these contributions have developed this sort of robust epistemic uh, mechanism, it is only now that we have a sufficiently robust epistemology to apply to theology as well. Whereas previous models, you know, going all the way back to uh, foundationalism and and the, the 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 previous generation of approaches, they just were not sufficiently robust to adequately work with the issue of theology. So because of that, um, people had to <clears throat> religious people were put in a in in a kind of a difficult situation. But finally, the the tools are there for us to develop. Uh, using the same mechanism to develop a, 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 a viable um, epistemology of religion. Okay, however, I do think she is missing a final step, a logical step in this process that I'll, I will address next. Uh, but before I do, I want to kind of point out the, something that should have been already clear based on what we covered is that uh, these terminologies used by the different contributors are more or less synonymous. So Quine uses the, the idea of a web of beliefs, but Kuhn adopts that and calls it paradigms. And then Lakatos comes in and calls it competing research programs. But essentially, they these ideas are, are more or less the same. They're just synonyms for, but and because they're, they're looked at from a different direction but they, they cover the same thing. And, and then I use, uh, I have my own terminology and I use the, the phrase theoretical models, uh, essentially in the same way that all these previous uh, term, terms are used here synonymously. So before we continue on, I wanted to to bring that up just to to have clarity that it's different phrases, but they all tend to mean, mean the same thing. Okay, so now coming back to everything we've covered so far since the beginning, we mentioned how, there's been this sort of pendulum effect that has created an overcorrection, but it's the pendulum is a two-dimensional swinging mechanism. And what we need is actually kind of a three-way pendulum because we have a shift from pre-modernism, which made a set of assumptions, like for example, the existence of the forms and all these things that later were discarded. And then there was a correction in the opposite direction where uh, the modern approach attempted to develop certainty based on this foundationalist metaphor that ended up kind of not working in the end. And when both of these two approaches uh, collapsed, or at least they they seemed, uh, in, they seemed at least to some portion of the population not to be viable anymore, there was another reaction, in, which is to say, okay, there is no way to know anything. So I guess anything goes, anybody's opinion is, is as good as the next. So we have a swing to relativism, which is uh, something that postmodernism has been used, like the term postmodernism has been applied to that. But um, we've kind of tried to re reclaim this term for something different. And then, so what I'm saying now is that uh, this presentation here, the, the process outlined by Nancy Murphy, where we go from Quine to... Um, um, Kuhn to Lakatos to McIntyre. Uh, this is in fact um, a more robust version of, of postmodernism that is actually a solution to the overcorrection of modernism. And it is based on epistemic humility. In other words, it is a most more realistic understanding of, of our ability to understand reality around us. Okay, so with that said, um, I want to... Uh, kind of take everything that we covered so far and, and move a step further because I think this is the logical implication of, of Nancy Murphy's presentation. And I think the answer to, to everything we covered so far is that um, we need to learn to work with multiple simultaneously viable models. So I'm, again, I'm using the word model here in the same way that Lakatos used the word research program and so on or paradigms. Um, but we're using this epistemological mechanism or strategy, not just to some scientific question, not just to the study of some aspect of reality, but to all of reality as a whole. So we're 
we're taking the methodology and we're expanding it to everything. But the problem is we're still, we still have the same epistemic limitations. We we have limited access to, to the physics or to the material world. I'm using physics and metaphysics here in the in the old way. We have limited access to the to the material reality, and we, we don't have access to the immaterial reality because of the limitation of our senses and, and so on. So um because we cannot uh, because of these epistemic limitations, we cannot arrive at a complete confidence um, regarding what reality is like. But what we can do is to come up with multiple models and work with them simultaneously. So if we apply Lakato's principle of computing research programs, that allows us to have multiple models. And then McIntyre allows us to have one dominant model. So we could say, okay, this model is the primary model because this is the best we have at, at this moment in time. This is this best explains um, reality, wh whatever the model. Uh, I'm not identifying that at this time, but uh, <clears throat> within this this approach, we could pick one model and say, okay, this is this is the primary or dominant model, but um, all the other models are, res there's other models that are respectable as well, which implies that there has to be some kind of threshold of viability because there's some models that just, uh, we cannot consider anymore. They're no longer viable. So kind of like when we talked about Lakatos with some, some models are progressive, some are degenerating at some level of degeneration, we just got to say, okay, that's enough or we discard it. So we need to think in terms of some kind of threshold of viability and then to say, okay, uh, the models above it, they're still in play and they have some level of respectability, but then there is there is one dominant model at any given time that, that people focus on. Well, there's a few that focus on this alternative stuff and all the other models uh, are no longer viable at this now, unless at this point in time, at least, unless somebody comes up with a major change and they find a way to fix their model to make it viable. And we need this because we cannot allow every possible imaginary scenario to be taken seriously within academia. There's limited attention. There's a, a limited um, intellectual capacity to address this stuff. So there can, people can only do so much. So we need people's attention to be on the dominant one, but we need to allow space for some of these other ones to coexist because it could turn out at some point in time that one of the lesser models might, might still turn out to work and we need to keep working on them and not discard them, but we cannot give our attention to everything. So this idea of a threshold it needs to be there. Now, of course, there's a question, how we decide this? Where do we put it? Where's the threshold? That That's definitely a conversation to be had. However, a lot of this is already informally done. I'm just saying that we need to create a more form formal representation of this process because people are already saying that, okay, I don't agree with this model, but I'm going to take it more seriously than this other models because this one still seems like uh, relatively rational, okay? So this, I think, this idea of a threshold of viability is the final paradigm that concludes this entire series of intellectual developments for the past 2,500 years. And I believe this is as far as humanity can go because of our epistemic limitations. We don't have access to metaphysics. We have limited access to the physical world. And unfortunately, that's probably gonna be the case for the foreseeable future. So this is probably uh, the best we can have to work with for, for some time to go. Um, so anyway, um, within this paradigm, before, if we consider the, you know, if we consider any of these worldviews, um, in the pre-modern world, the, the worldview that people function and always kind of had supremacy over the science. So, so we try to adapt uh, the things we, we, we saw within empirical reality to fit within the people's worldview. In the modern world, the science, science had dominance over worldview. So essentially, if your worldview didn't line up with science, you, you, you should regard, discard it or else you are no longer considered a, a rational human being. 
uh, within this postmodern era, these these two things are probably a lot more on a on a on the same level where there's this kind of a a back and forth a, a dialectic between the two an interaction between the two because um depending on which world you're coming from it affects how science um, how accurate science could be in certain situations like i described before so in a worldview, for example, where the supernatural exists, there are situations where scientific experiments will give false positive or false negatives because it has it lacks the capacity to uh, interact with anything supernatural. So within the postmodern worldview, in the postmodern paradigm, um, these these two components need to be better aligned. And there needs to be some interaction, <clears throat> and that that dialogue back and forth between them needs to be allowed within the the public academic sphere. So, in other words, um, people should be able to publish, for example, materials in support of any of these other models, and people and you know the scientific community or the uh, wherever else this is taking place, like within philosophical publications or anywhere else, uh, people need to be able to say like, hey, this is not the dominant the dominant view at this moment in time, but it's still a legitimate view. So it's good information to have, even if we don't necessarily agree with it. And there needs to be some level of respectability afforded to some of these other models so that they can continue to, to do their research and, and develop, or even to falsify themselves and come down below the, the threshold of viability so we can discard them and move on. And they're not gonna be able to do that if their, their contributions are always ignored and discarded within the public um, conversation. Okay, so I think that the conclusion of 2,500 years of intellectual history is this, this final idea of uh, multiple simultaneous models being run on a threshold of viability where they, they follow the, the characteristics described by, by some of the previous contributors like Lakatos, McIntyre, Quine, and, and Kuhn, and the others. Um, and this is probably the best humanity can have. And this is probably where we're going to be for, for the, the foreseeable future, however, however long that is, unless something drastic happens within the world of science and philosophy that uh, we, we cannot imagine at this moment in time. All right, so um, hope uh, you've enjoyed that and take care.